Resnick Institute is a program at Caltech that supports the uh, underpinnings of uh, sustainability science and it focuses on the most important challenges uh, in the areas of research, education, and communication. So we're interested in focusing on research on fundamental issues that have, if they can be addressed and you know, fundamental barriers can be overcome, can have long-term and large-scale impacts, things that could create new energy technologies that have the capacity to scale to the terawatt level. So, so really paradigm-changing innovation. That's right. Tell us a little bit about the kind of research that's happening here in solar. So the research here uh, in solar energy uh, spans a wide variety of uh, topical challenges, but it's very much circumscribed by this approach of a focus on fundamentals, the focus on what's the limit to the limiting efficiency of a solar photovoltaic cell. What it does a solar fuels generator that directly transforms solar photons into fuels from sunlight, what does that look like? So those are the kinds of things that we're, we're interested in addressing. So I got to ask you, walking in the building, there's this, you know, this big sign on artificial photosynthesis. Right. This is a fascinating concept. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit, what, what, what is artificial photosynthesis and why does it matter? So what solar artificial photosynthesis does to create fuels from sunlight, it takes the energy of these charge carriers, instead of turning them into electricity, directly turns them into chemical fuels by catalytic processes that operate at the plus and minus terminals, the cathode and the anode of this cell. Does this mean then that we're looking at, instead of solar energy being used for electricity, potentially solar energy being used to say fill up our cars with fuel at some point, the actual creation of Yeah, if you think about it, fuel. this is a really exciting opportunity because yeah. when I was a kid, the uh, solar photovoltaic technology uh, was at a similar stage of being very much in the fundamental R&D domain. We knew how to build a photovoltaic panel, but they weren't very efficient. They certainly weren't very inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen this incredible progress to the point where we now see a worldwide industry emerging. In fact, solar photovoltaics is now the largest optoelectronics industry in the world. It just surpassed the flat panel display industry in, in volume. Yeah. So that's an example of what can be done. Uh, and if you think about the goals that were set by uh, Secretary Chu in his SunShot program from the Department of Energy, it was to achieve what's known as grid parity, roughly speaking, equivalence of the cost per kilowatt hour of electricity coming from renewable sources, from solar, as from uh, uh, central utility plants that are driven by fossil fuels. So what's exciting now is that solar energy is now not only going to reach grid parity, and you can argue about what that means, but it, it's going to actually go below the level of grid parity. When that happens, now we're going to be in a, in a world that many people have not yet anticipated of cheap electricity. So what, the question is, what can you do with this cheap electricity? If you just have solar panels that can't store the energy, then we need to find ways that we can utilize electric energy when the resource is there to do other things. Pump water, desalinate water, create fuels. Dr. Fromer, this place is amazing. What's going on here? This is a chemistry lab in the Schlinger building here on the Caltech campus. This is one of our preeminent centers for uh, chemical synthesis studies. So people here are making the chemicals that we use in the world. So this is a place where some of the solutions to the world's sustainability problems are being found? That's right. In these Hume Hoods, people are making new chemicals and understanding their properties and figuring out what is useful. Wow, amazing. We always start by thinking about the big picture and by telling uh, what is the fundamental limits to what it is that we can achieve. And along the way, you'll pick up uh, incremental changes to what exists right now in technologies while you're looking for these big breakthroughs. A key enabler is to give the creative people that are here the freedom to explore uh, as broadly as they need to. And if we can get through the work that they're trying to do right now, it really sets us on a path towards a, a massive transformation in the future. So it's a small place with such a big impact. How do you choose the people you choose here? It involves really looking for a group of people that are uh, very creative. Obviously, a place like Caltech, we're picking the best scientists that we can find out there. But it's not just about finding the best scientists. It's really finding the people who have creative and different ways of looking at things and that want to engage in an interdisciplinary discussion in a place where uh, physicists and chemists and biologists and engineers and economists can, uh, can really uh, all work together to solve some of these really challenging problems.
My work relates to the small region of flow between a moving surface, for example, on a commercial airliner, and the quiescent air around it. And that's responsible for about 50% of the drag on a commercial airliner. So if we were able to reduce that by maybe 30%, that would relate to millions of dollars of uh, reduction in uh, fuel burn, uh, in emissions. I would really potentially revolutionize the way that we uh, transport people and uh, materials around in the world today. I study the ways in which the Earth naturally deals with excess CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and with the Resnick Institute, I'm developing a catalyst to speed up these reactions to deal with excess CO2 and the associated climate change problems on the time scales at which we are actually releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. I work on new light capture and conversion strategies, essentially ways that we can take sunlight, water, CO2, and make fuel, say ethanol, methanol, things in those lines. And I'm part of a team that's developing, developing a solar-powered electrochemical waste rat treatment system to provide uh, sustainable wastewater treatment to uh, people in developing countries where they don't have access to the infrastructure uh, necessary for conventional wastewater treatment. I work on molecules called catalysts that lower the energies of reactions. And the reaction we're most interested in is turning CO2 into a liquid fuel. If we are able to turn CO2 into a fuel, the CO2 that's released from burning those fuels can be recaptured and hopefully reused uh, to sort of close that loop in the carbon cycle. I study ways of converting uh, cheap and abundant materials like water and carbon dioxide into useful fuels or chemicals. This is exciting because these reactions require an energy input, which for us is sunlight. And if we accomplish these reactions using sunlight, we're essentially putting sunlight in a bottle, energy that you can use later. We spent a, a day here. It's been a, a great pleasure uh, talking with some of the students um, and some of the faculty. This is a place that's infused with hope. Part of that, no doubt, comes from your own leadership. So when you wake up in the morning, you know what, what gives you the most, the most hope as you look out at this set of problems and issues? It's the energy and the enthusiasm of our young people. I see this in my own children, I see this in my students, uh, that's the thing that gives me profound optimism. Not only are they interested, excited about the world, uh, but they're really committed to finding innovative advances that address fundamental science problems that can have an impact. You know, for me, what gets me out of bed in the morning is the opportunity to learn alongside them.